just put it in words. One, one night, she read about um, two and a half kilometers uh, from one side of the village where they were staying within the rural areas um, to the other way the uncles were sleeping and all the other elders were sleeping and she ran there she doesn't know how she went through the barbed wire uh, and arrived there and was shouting and said there are people in the river they want to take me Western medicine remains an entirely material, it regards the patient as a material object, a chemical object that needs to have chemicals inserted into it to make it better, uh, or to have bits of it cut out. But in Western medical terms, I'm actually um, falling into the liminal space, if you like, because I'm fighting against my own profession. My own profession has taught me that if you've got high cholesterol, you're likely to have a heart attack. And yet I'm saying to the patient, I think that medication you're taking is rubbish. And I think that your, your fear of your cholesterol is also rubbish. It's not true. So I've got a kind of... They say if, you, if you're not uncomfortable, then you need to review your position. It's a kind of process where I think if you're not in that liminal space, then you're going to end up not progressing. During a ritual's liminal stage, a person navigates how to structure their identity, time or community in the old way and a new way, which the ritual establishes. More recently, this term has broadened to describe political and cultural change as well. In the liminal space, social hierarchies may be reversed or temporarily dissolved, continuity of tradition may become uncertain and future outcomes once taken for granted may be thrown into doubt. The reordering of hierarchy during liminality creates a fluid situation that enables new institutions and customs to become established. Perhaps the biggest obstacle facing the acceptance of traditional healing practices in South Africa has been the pervading stigma and fear often associated with it. The Witchcraft Suppression Act is a move to further stigmatise the role of the indigenous healer. Anything that was superstitious in nature was seen to be witchcraft and was in line with British uh, legislation in that regard. And as of yet, no one has actually been sentenced to jail time by the Witchcraft Suppression Act. There's been cases which have involved the Witchcraft Suppression Act and, and related things, but no one's actually ever been sentenced according to the Act. Uh, and that's primarily because those people who do identify themselves as witches um, are a very small minority of South Africa's population and that's why there's a lobby on at the moment to have the act repealed because it infringes precisely on the right to religious practices and beliefs. In terms of full integration uh, we need to realize the fact that there's only two countries in, in the world which have effectively fully integrated the different systems of healthcare. And now we're talking both Western biomedical practitioners as well as indigenous health practitioners. Um, and those are China and India, I believe. Asian countries such as India, South Korea and China have been the most progressive in terms of integrating traditional and complementary medicine practices into their national healthcare systems. This move by the government has allowed the recognition and popularity of practices like acupuncture. The creation of the THP Act in South Africa is moving towards integration at this level. To have both Western health practitioners and indigenous health practitioners uh, functioning on, on the same level and that was basically the push to have it recognized and have traditional health practitioners registered in terms of the act. It's, it's a general practice where we mostly use what we call integrative medicine, um, medical diagnostic techniques and treatment but coupled with uh, supportive measures, healthcare, things that are kind of more natural.
and, and in this practice particularly we do a lot of acupuncture. So it was surprisingly popular actually among hospital patients. If you gave them the option of having acupuncture or, or painkillers, say, they would always choose the acupuncture. And, they, and the response was surprisingly gratifying. What we try and do is get away from the fact that you've got some condition that you've got to take this pill forever because that's really not resolving the issue. So yeah, it is a, it's a case of trying to integrate and, and as you say, treat holistically the, the patient there, try and find all the background causes and address all of them, not just treat the end point symptom that the patient came with. You know, if you, if you go with an illness to a, to a general practitioner or a specialist, they will tend to manage the illness according to our Western medical model, which is, you know, taking the history, making a diagnosis and giving you the appropriate medication. But 99% of our medication tends to be to suppress the symptom of your condition. But quite often those symptoms are a, a kind of a warning sign, an indication that there's something wrong. And very often in Western medicine we don't address the thing that's wrong. But I think we've got to look at the fact that we're sitting in a you know, multicultural, cosmopolitan environment. And we can't legislate any one aspect of the environment out of existence. If there's something that's culturally imbued, it's historically there for a long time, you've got to be able to um, keep it alive in a healthy sense. In modern South Africa, many people still consult traditional healers in matters of physical and emotional upheaval. The holistic practice that relies on messages from our ancestors operates in two main forms. Herbalists, who use natural medicinal herbs and prescribe these to clients, and diviners, spirit mediums who communicate with the ancestors in combination with consulting with the client to diagnose and treat maladies and conditions of the body and spirit. Traditional healer John Lockley, who was initiated in the Tosa culture, uses his spiritual gifts to treat those in spiritual need in America and Europe. As Sangomas, we work with plants, we work with ceremony, and we work with dreams, and we work with prayer. Basically to help people to wake up to that intuitive intelligence within them. So you can call it the heart. So when people are connected with their heart, not just the, the heart as an idea, but that deeper knowing inside of you, which is your intuition, which goes beyond language, and goes beyond thoughts. This medicine is open to all people. It's not open to black or, you know, it doesn't matter about the color of your skin. It's open to all human beings because it's about how you can become more intuitive, how you can, can become more instinctual. Instinctual does not mean becoming barbaric. Becoming instinctual means to become more awake, more mindful, more connected to nature. So this medicine is as relevant to black African people as it is to a Russian Siberian person walking through the forests, you know. It's probably more relevant today than it was in the 1800s because of how we've lost connection with nature and also how sick people have become spiritually. So Sangoma medicine can help people to connect with their heart space, with their intuition, with their dreams, with their ancestors and with their prayers. And it's been um, it's been broken down, you know, hundreds of years ago. It broke down in, in in Europe, and that's part of why people fear it because they don't understand it. You know, I feel that the most important thing is that um, the law is coming, and that's good to have a law. But um, a law without correct education is, you know, it's still going to carry on the way it's carrying on. You could have the best law in the world, which says that a traditional healer can become a medical doctor and do everything. But if you've got people on the ground who are full of fear and they don't trust them, it's still going to stay the same, you know. So education from the ground up is very important. Ethnobotanist Jean-Francois Sobieski is among the first in South Africa to demystify the uncertainty around traditional medicine and to describe its use in the holistic processes of traditional healing practice. Trainee uh, doctors could actually learn that traditional healing is not just superstition, and magic, but they're actually using sophisticated technologies. Because a lot of what I've seen in the literature is that the mindset in academia is that traditional medicine equals primitive, equals superstition, and no technology whatsoever. There's no medical efficacy, which is completely erroneous. It's an erroneous belief. It could be applied in any of the fields, botany, anthropology, uh, ecology, you know, to, to kind of incorporate um, the base 
basic fundamentals of what traditional medicine is. That would be a first step. Ingaske unka kubem. Amen. Yonke lento ibeni. Amen. Kuba silala ngeng kubeni. Amen. Sisonge. Amen. Sikula kento enye. Amen. Kuka shuka na ngonge na kwetu. Ati indo kwa na unge na ngo shobo luti. Amen. Abantu ke abanga zange ba ifumeli lengo lengo. Of course. Why couldn't you come, Nandi? Come, 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 the Kulen is saying, Wim. The man and his tongue is in the Abandu Basek higher Bengana Kinto. Uma Kulu Uma Makama, ma'am. Why is it by a tetai? Atilica, eh? Got an angelum done as a primer. The, the calling is, in a sense, the beginning of the process. And nobody's going to complain about the admissions process. That, I think, is uh, not open to regulation. If somebody is going into the world of traditional healing um, through a calling, then that's purely a personal process. You can't regulate that. Because unlike Western medicine, which was already regulated, and we've got our health professions council and our universities and medical associations, it was already a highly regulated, qualification-driven system. Um, and although you might have a calling to do medicine, the chances of you getting in were remote. And I'm sure any traditional healer who was going to be taking on a pupil would also be selecting his pupils. Just because somebody had a calling doesn't necessarily mean that the person he's going to see will necessarily take him on. He might say... No, no, you're not good, I'm not taking you. <laughs> In which case, there's a, a selection process going on there. And that, I don't think, needs regulation. What needs regulation is the process coming out the other end. And I don't know if it's possible to regulate traditional medicine in the sense that it's so diverse. It's culturally diverse and geographically diverse. But traditional medicine in itself produces certain problems over time and those I think need to be assessed, those need to be investigated carefully. Every time there's a very serious illness or a death from traditional medicine, that's when you really need careful investigation. The positive and beneficial effects of traditional medicines have been thrown into doubt as academic writing often denies or doesn't even recognize its scientific efficacies. Further, African traditional medicine is unregulated in South Africa due to legislation contained in the Medicine and Related Substances Controls Act of 2009. So the MRSCA basically outlines the various procedures and steps that pharmaceutical companies, for instance, need to take in order for a drug to be passed, um, clinical trials and those sorts of things, in order for a drug to meet the certain standards set by the legislation in order for it to be fit for human consumption. But the problem is, is that the new regulations which are set to enforce complementary medicines uh, do not take into account traditional African medicines because of the uh, lacunae, the, the legal gap that exists in the definition. Um, because it only, it only refers to medicines which are, regu which are uh, prescribed by medical practitioners which are registered in terms of the Allied Health Professions Act. Now, traditional African practitioners are registered in terms of the THP Act, which is the Traditional Health Practitioners Act. Now, because of that, because the um, new regulations don't specifically refer to the THP Act, but instead refer to the Allied Health Professions Act, the actual medicines prescribed by traditional African practitioners, your Sangomas and Inyangas, for instance, aren't regulated at all. So there's no legislative regime which is in place to ensure that traditional African medicine is regulated and controlled in a formal Western bureaucratic sense, that is. Look, I think it's not going to be ever fully integrated, but I think there could be at least uh, an aware, a, ra a raising of awareness so that when you, you have people crossing over from one form of healthcare to the other, so if somebody comes out of the backwaters of the Eastern Cape and they're 
been through a process with the traditional healer, but they're still not better and they come to a Western doctor, it would be nice if they had some kind of documentation that gave the Western doctor an indication of what they've already been through. And by the same token, if a Western doctor's got a patient who's not better after you know, 15 years of anti-inflammatories and surgery, and he goes to the traditional doctor, I think it's important for the traditional doctor to know what that person's been through. The problem is we're too comfortable with what we have, and that's why we actually don't want to change. Uh, but yes, we can preserve a lot of different things, um, the traditions, the cultures, cultures are changing, so we actually end up asking ourselves uh, what culture we're we trying to preserve, you know, because we end up getting lost and no one knows anything about those cultures. I was interested in exploring about um, spirit mediums, um, my work in terms of how it's related to, to the ancestral spiritual world and um, that is what led me to do anthropology. So my research now looks at exploring spirit mediated landscape and material culture among Shona and Venda artists. So basically uh, what we're trying to do is to try and understand um, how the spirit world is able to, to, to define or construct a meaning uh, or give us an understanding, a better understanding what the painting's about. Uh, because I myself, as the one who makes the paintings, I don't fully understand what they're about. Matthias Chirombo's main inspiration for his paintings comes from his mother's spiritual divining gift. Nurtured by her encouragement to focus on his dreams and his artistic abilities, he has infused this into his work along with his research, even dedicating a few paintings to the spirit mermaid from which his mother's gift comes. I've got paint. I can't see what I'm doing, but I'm just trying to to guide that energy, you know, I feel something, then I turn my hands and um, from that then I open my arms a little bit later, then check what I'm doing, what's, what's, what's coming out, and then I continue, you know, I try and understand. So, in other words, I'm also learning. I don't know what I'm doing, I'm just, you know, it's an intangible feeling. It's a long process until I feel I think it's finished. Then I put it on the side. Um, sometimes it can take a year or maybe um, a few weeks uh, for me to, to finish it or to understand what it's about. Ulala ufuke ne yes. Utwe hamba iya kwandwe. Akukwazu ya kwandwe. Kuba kandwe irisef. As cause your compa corn. Utter a cook home lamb of Nebuya corn, a cool, a cook was we are cool. Cuba if Valeki Limila, Cuba Caloca Belungu by Tata, Utter if Valeki, Cuba Caloco Imilambo, Lena Sebenza, Cuyo, Eminek, if Valeki, Quenza irreserve. Ufman seke kwa imfele ezi sisebe nsayo. Kama. Ukunweba izi shokojo. Kama. Eze nyamakasi. Kama. Aku kwazu zifuman. Kama. Iba ngumusebe nsi. Kama. Kufuneke kutengiwe. So I think from a legal perspective is that we need to differentiate between what is public and what is private land. With private land, you're, you're only having maybe one or two or a body of people who are controlling the actual access to that land. In which case, access to that sort of thing would only need the permission of the specific landowners. When it comes to private, uh, public land, sorry, your municipalities and the government are then obviously the, the authorities to consider when seeking access to that sort of land. It's going to be the private land that's going to be the issue because people are going to want to know what sort of permission they're giving in order for people to access that land. Um, particularly land which has for a long time been used for, for religious purposes. If that land is then sold to another user who wants to develop it for instance, then of course then you, then you get huge petitions by, by the various religious affiliates and their bodies and their representatives um, seeking that uh, it be preserved for those specific practices. How can you bring something in from the top? It's like, how should I do this, you know? So here it's just like this top, 
this is the this is a jug right the bottom is the is the way things are practiced at the bottom right okay so you've got myself you've got other sangomas we're working in the ground we're working in the townships we're mixing herbs we're getting plants so we work in the ground it's called the ground swell okay and then as you go up you've got institutions like education and you've got um you know basic institutions of of instruction in a, in a culture and then at the top you've got the law and you've got the structures of the legal institutions and things like that so how can you bring something in from the top when there's no basis in the ground there's no education at all it's it's like throwing water onto um onto a muddy road you know it's not going to hold it's just going to evaporate it's going to disappear liminality often occurs in three stages separation the liminal period and reassimilation you know as a, as young people we we believe that we need everybody to be integrated but as you get older i think you realize that you don't need everybody to be integrated you just need everybody to be aware of each other um, you don't actually you can't socially engineer integration it doesn't happen but you can um, remove the stigma of it and say, well, it's fine, everybody's different. It doesn't matter if we're different. We can, we can afford to be different as long as we understand that we're different and that this person's difference is not better or worse than ours. It's just different. It's just the way it is. It was summed up well by my father-in-law who said, if you're not radical when you're 18, you've got no heart. And if you're still radical when you're 40, you've got no brains. In South Africa, we do inhabit a liminal space, and this is no clearer than in our current state of exploring options and possibilities to live together in a culturally diverse but unified space.